welcome. You've come to the right place. Great to have you all. I know you could have been doing lots of other things on a Monday afternoon. So we're going to talk about only the number one question in the history of the universe. And I know all the other people out there, they're just eating their sandwiches and you know, they're talking about a rock concert or something, but we're, we're in the deep end of the pool here today. So, um, so this story starts, it really starts in Electrical Engineering 306, which was widely reputed to be the hardest class in the electrical engineering department. It was the first semester of electromagnetic fields and waves, and you're doing three and four dimensional calculus and all this kind of stuff. And so Dr. Narayanan, he was like the newest professor in the department, and he was a hard ass. <laughs> and uh, one day everybody came back after taking a test, and the average was 42. Everybody in the room was just in, in a state of mourning. It was like in a movie where all the soldiers are scattered on the battlefield, and they have blood coming out of their mouths, and oh, you know, and there's and there's. French horns playing, and, and that was EE 306 that day, and he wasn't compassionate, he wasn't nice, he didn't say, oh, I failed you guys, you didn't understand, he didn't say any of that. He said, I'm gonna flunk all of you. You think I'm grading on a curve? I'm not gonna grade this on a curve. I'll fail every one of you. You guys think that in the land of the blind, the man with one eye gets to be king, and no, if you only have one eye, you die in this class. And that's where I got, if any of you people in, in my business world have heard me say, in the land of the blind, the man with an eye gets to be king. I stole it from him. That's where I got it. So yes, I somehow barely managed to make it out of that class. But then the next class after that, it was the, the, the next semester. I, it actually was pretty good. And, and I liked it. And I made much use of it. And I will, I will actually circle back to that in a little bit. So, so that's how I got to be at Penn State today. So I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, in an extremely, extremely conservative church upbringing, and my dad was a minister. When I was 14, this guy came to our church for a week, and every night he would have another lecture, and we would go there. And I thought this was way, way more interesting than what we normally did in church, because normally we're just like parsing Greek and Hebrew and studying Bible stuff. And this guy was talking about science. And he was, a, he was a pioneer in what is called the Young Earth Creationist Movement and the Flood Geology Movement. And he was explaining how, well, the Earth is 6,000 years old and you can't trust the carbon dating. It was this whole entire thing. And I thought it was fantastic and it was way more interesting than normal stuff, but as I got older, I started to little by little figure out that there was a lot of problems with this whole thing. Like, for example, you can see stars that are 100 million light years away. And like, I measured the speed of light in a physics lab, you know, and, and, and not only that, I understood that it's only because the speed of light is a constant that matter and energy, conservation of matter and energy, because matter and energy are interchangeable. Like, there's all these little problems that's like, hmm, you know, there's no way the Earth can actually be 6,000 years old. This doesn't work. This can't even be made to work. You know, it's sort of like little cracks in the foundation, like little leaks going on. And then you start to have these questions. Well, a few years later, I went to a lecture by a guy named Hugh Ross, and Hugh Ross was an astrophysicist, and what you see here is a graphical representation of the Big Bang. And so 13.7 billion years ago, there's this um, instantaneous acceleration from um, all matter being compressed to a point, and then it expands outward, and then you have this process of development. And what he was explaining was that it's kind of like if you had a spray bottle under your kitchen sink where you, you, know, you squirt water out of it and you twist the nozzle, there's one setting where it'll just spray out like a mist, and then there's another setting where it'll dribble out in a stream, and then somewhere in the middle there's a happy medium, and it, it, it makes the right amount of spray. And he said, the expansion of the universe has a very similar property where if it went out too fast, it would 
it wouldn't even form stars. And if it went out too slow, it would just collapse back in on itself. And the difference between too much and too little is plus or minus 0 0.00000, like with 120 decimal places. And if the last decimal was plus or minus one, then the whole universe would not work out. Like this is how fine-tuned the Big Bang is. And you can extend that to, you know, what if the mass of a proton was a little bit different? What if the mass of an electron, what if the charge of a proton was just a little bit different and it would be a mess or it wouldn't work at all? And so this is called the anthropic principle. And what Hugh Ross was saying was, really, when you got down to it, that the idea of in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth was a way bigger thing than this guy was ever really willing to imagine, okay? Like, he was trying to crunch it down to a literal, completely simplistic interpretation of Genesis, and what, what this guy was saying was, hey, wait a minute, like, there's obviously something very intentional going on here. You don't get 120 decimal places of precision by accident, but like, let's not dumb this down, because if you, if you study the actual science, it's actually way more amazing than that. And so what I ended up doing was trading a 6,000-year-old perfect universe for a Big Bang fine-tuned to 120 decimal places. It was a much, a much grander view of nature, and I thought that was great. I thought that was fantastic. Well, um, then, so everything's fine. That's really interesting. Um, and you go along a while. Well, like I said, I'm a pastor's kid. I went into business and engineering. Um, I, I did all kinds of stuff in engineering. I, I designed speakers. I wrote an Ethernet book. I worked for... Uh, a digital networking company that sold automation equipment to factories. My brother, Brian, uh, went to seminary, got a master's degree in theology, and then moved to China where he was doing missionary work. And in four years of living in China, Brian is almost an atheist. He's basically thrown the whole thing out the window. And we are writing in that little tiny they call that a bus in China. I know you wouldn't call it a bus, but that's a, that's a Chinese bus. We're riding around in the back of this bus, and we're having yet another argument, okay? We'd been kind of debating about this back and forth. Um, and when I got to China, so I already knew that there were problems, and I already knew that he was questioning everything. But when I got to China, I realized he's already thrown this out the window. He doesn't believe any of this stuff anymore. And this is kind of unsettling to me uh, because, you know, you have your family system and you have the way everything works and everybody believes similar things and, you know, and we have Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's kind of on the same page. And now it's like, wow, you know, next time we have Thanksgiving dinner, you know, Brian's probably going to look at us like, what do you guys think you're doing? Who do you think you're talking to, you know? And so we're having an argument. I found myself kind of retreating to what I felt comfortable with which was engineering. And I said, Brian, I said, look at the hand at the end of your arm. I said, this is a nice piece of engineering. I said, you don't think this is an accumulation of random accidents, do you? He's like, hold on. <laughs> Not so fast, Perry. He goes, if you got a hundred million falcons flying around for 10 million years, that's a lot of falcons, right, Perry? Yeah. That's true, that's a lot of falcons. And he goes, all you need is like one accidental mutation every now and then that makes its vision better and then it'll hunt better than all the other falcons and then all the other falcons die out and the falcons just got better, right? I go like, maybe. And he goes, okay, so you don't need a designer, Perry. And I listened to that and I thought, you know what, I don't know anything about what he's talking about. Like, I, I've never studied evolution. I don't actually have much of an opinion about evolution. But it doesn't seem like it would be accidental, but I don't know. 
Like, they never taught me that in engineering school. Like, multiply falcons have accidental copying error, and once in a while it will be better. They never taught me that in engineering school. That was never one of the ways that you optimize a system. So I had the good sense to just, I just kind of stopped. And I stopped arguing with them. I thought, I thought to myself, like I was trying to think five, you know, you argue with somebody and you're trying to be five chess moves ahead of them. <laughs> My five chess moves ahead was, I don't know, but I know a lot of biologists would agree with him and not me. And they might know something I don't know. And this is where my engineering education really kicked in. So like, I remember when I was building stereo equipment, there were these uh, things I was trying to figure out and I just could not figure it out. I get to engineering school, I find out, oh, those are imaginary numbers. If you take those numbers and make them into imaginary numbers, all the equations work out. But of course, you have to know how to use imaginary numbers. And all the engineers probably know exactly what I'm talking about right now. And I thought, you know, maybe there's like imaginary numbers in biology. Maybe there's like some other thing. I'm, so I'm going to stop arguing with Brian, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to find out. I'm just going to find out. And I am, in fact, I'm going to let the, I'm going to let science and engineering make this decision for me. Because Brian and I had already been arguing about this for about two years. And you have not had a theological argument until you've had it with a guy who has a master's degree in theology from a conservative seminary, and he knows Greek, and he knows Hebrew, he knows where all the bones are buried, he could back any, almost anybody into a corner, right? And I'm like, okay, that's too squishy, and I don't have a degree in theology, but I have a degree in engineering, and not only that, I've built a lot of stuff, and I've done a lot of stuff, and I know that I know that I know that I know certain things. And so if I really know something's true, then it's like, so if that story Brian's telling me about evolution, if that's true, there ought to be a way to like ground it in some kind of really fundamental principle and prove it, work out the math, whatever. There's gotta, it, it's gotta be out there. So here we go. And so I get on a plane and I go home and I start buying books like a banshee. Like entrepreneurs are very uh, obsessive people and so I just started obsessing about this. So I went crazy with it. Now, so is the hand at the end of my arm an accumulation of random accidents, or is there something more going on? That's the question. And so I said, anything that I can verify, this is an absolutely true fact. I'm going to put it on my chalkboard. I'm not going to erase anything. So I'm going to just get, put stuff on my chalkboard until somehow I can piece together a way of making sense of all this. All right. Now, this is my mom. And I want to give you a sense about my mom and my family because it'll help you understand the story, I think, a little bit better. My mom died about three years ago, but when I was 12, she went bipolar. And we didn't know that she was bipolar. All we knew was that life in our house was bedlam for like a year and a half. Like, you'd come home from school, you did not know, is she going to be in a good mood or in a bad mood? Is, is she going to throw something at you? Or are you going to be like the most wonderful child in the whole world? Like, you just didn't know, right? And so, you come home from school and you'd start having dinner or whatever and there'd be some fight. The whole family would just be in chaos until bedtime. And, and, um, and my brother and sister and I would, would meet up with my dad and go, Dad, you know, Mom cut the legs off my jeans, or Mom threw my stuff away, or Mom said this embarrassing thing to me, or I got in this fight with her, and it would just, and like, Dad, do something about this. He didn't, well, you know, he was trying, but it wasn't really working. And so he started casting around looking for solutions. He had no idea what was wrong with her. And she's doing weird things and saying weird things to people. And people are at church or asking us questions. And it was not fun. Eventually, he gets her to a psychiatrist. Now, by this point, 
So he's a pastor, he's working in this church, and they're starting to put pressure on him. You know, pastor's wives can't be acting nutty and doing all this weird stuff. Like, you got to do something about this. And he's trying. He takes her to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist diagnoses her. Your wife has manic, she's manic depressive, bipolar, with mild schizophrenia. And so I'm prescribing medication. And so, here, have her take these pills. And that should help. All right, so... This church where I grew up, the pastor, the guy in charge, he was on this war against psychology. He did not like psychology. He thought psychology was like a secular religion, and they were trying to replace Christianity with a secular religion. There was even a famous psychologist who was a Christian guy named James Dobson. He did not like James Dobson. He thought that guy was evil. So he was kind of in this rampage. When he found out that my dad took my mom to a psychiatrist... They had this meeting, and they asked my dad to resign. They said, no, 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 you're not doing that. We're not going down that road. And your, your family is out of control, and pastor's wives need to have their act together, and your kids are out of control, especially me. Okay, for real. There were, they were complaining about me, too. And so uh, maybe the next day, this pastor and this other guy come over to our house, and they sit us all down, and they explain to us, we've asked your dad to resign. They weren't firing him, but they were demoting him, okay? Uh, it's like, well, you're not going to have any leadership capabilities, and we'll find this other job for you to do. And so we're sitting there listening to all this, and I didn't have much to say about it. I was 13. My sister was 18. She was livid. My sister was hacked off. And, and Robin says to the guy, she goes, she goes, if people knew what your daughter does at night, you'd be resigning. <laughs> and he says to her, Robin, we're not here to talk about my family today. We're here to talk about your family. <laughs> Which I don't even know how he said it with a straight face, but he did. <laughs> he did. And the next Sunday... The main pastor gets up in front of 2,000 people, and he says, because of some problems with Betty and the family, uh, Bob is resigning from his position. Is he stepping down as an elder? And, you know, and it was like this big embarrassing thing. And I remember I went to school the next day, and this kid said to me, Perry, I heard your dad quit. And I remember thinking, my dad didn't quit anything. My dad got railroaded into a forced resignation, but of course... I don't know, can you even really try to explain this to everybody? Not really. Well, all right, so here's what happens next. Um, so this guy that made this announcement, and, and every, he, was a very, he was a very intimidating guy. He was very articulate. He was very persuasive. When he said jump, everybody would jump. Most people were afraid of him. My dad was not afraid of him. And my dad got in his face because within the next few weeks, my mom got a lot better. Our whole life just changed. Now, it didn't completely fix the problems, but it was a lot better than it was. And she became much more subdued and much more reasonable. And it was obvious like that this was a medical issue. And he got in the guy's face and he said, she's not in rebellion and she wasn't sinning. This is a medical problem. This is a psychiatric issue. And the guy put her on medication, and it's working, and you made a mistake, and you were wrong, and you owe her an apology, and you owe me an apology. And within about eight or nine months, he got that apology. He got a letter. He got reinstated. He got an apology. And everything was back to normal. Um, and then a month later, my dad found out he had cancer. And then, well, I'll get to more of that later. But like this kind of gives you an idea of, of the conservative element that I grew up in. And it gives you an idea of the war between science and religion that I grew up in, right? So you have, you know, psychology is bad, psychiatry is bad, the earth is 6,000 years old. But you also had some very, very 
good elements of a very tightly knit community, which we were part of. And, and I'll get to some of that later, because there's some important things to say about that. But like this kind of sets the stage of this is where I've come from, and now I'm saying, okay, I'm actually going to let science make this decision for me because I know that I know that I know certain things. And my question is, is all you need is like random copying errors and millions of years of natural selection and you get a hand, is that true? Or is there something more? That was the question. Which brings us to electromagnetics and transmission lines, which you knew this was coming next, <laughs> right? You, I'm sure you totally knew. Well, I worked on a project in an acoustics class where I took Dr. Narayanan's wave stuff from electromagnetics and I translated it into acoustics. I was obsessed with, I was building stereo equipment since I was 13 years old and I had a little company and I was selling speakers and that's basically how I made a living most of my teenage years and into, into college. And so there's a kind of speaker that's not very common called a transmission line. If you know what a Bose wave radio is, for example, it's basically a transmission line. And I couldn't find a complete uh, analysis of how this thing worked. And so I decided that in my acoustics class, I was going to figure it out. Okay, and what I ended up having to do was literally start with Newton's law and derive the wave equation and then work out all the math. And it took me about two or three months, but after two or three months, I had it all figured out. And there was, it's very geeky, but there was something very satisfying and very exciting about being able to start with something really, really basic, like force equals mass times acceleration, and then just take math and work it out into some big complicated system and get the right answer. And I got an A on the paper. I was very happy about it. In fact, I have a website. It's I have that paper up on that website now. So I knew what it was like to get to the bottom of the swamp, like go to basic principles and work my way up. And when I went down the evolution rabbit hole, I knew I was looking for the same thing. If this is true, I should be able to reduce this down to first principles, and maybe this means the biologists know something the engineers don't. Or maybe the engineers know something the biologists don't. But the, the two worlds ought to converge at the bottom of the swamp. If we do our math and our physics and everything right, that should be true. So I had a almost a kinesthetic sense of what I was looking for. I knew what it felt like when I got there, I just didn't know what it was. So I go down the rabbit hole and I buy all these biology books and all of these evolution books and I'm reading all these websites and, I, and it's like ping pong between the left and the right and the, you know, the creationists and the evolutionists and all the different shades in between and there's all these little factions and, there's all, and it's like, oh my word, this, this topic is so hideously complex. I thought electrical engineering was hard, biology, that's hard. And so anyway, here I go, and I'm looking, and I was lost, I was completely lost for, for a while. Then, I suddenly had a realization. Now in 2002, I wrote a book called Industrial Ethernet. And the reason you, you need, all of you need to buy that book, it's $79 on Amazon, is because you might, on certain evenings and weekends, you can't sleep. <laughs> and if you have insomnia, then you should read my Ethernet book, which I wrote in a, one of my careers that I've, I've had numerous careers. So I wrote this book called Industrial Ethernet. It's published by the world's largest society of process control engineers called the ISA. It's in its third edition. And I wrote this book, and one day I'm studying DNA and like how do mutations work and how does the genetic code work and suddenly it's like, bam, I've seen this before. I know what this is. DNA isn't just a spiral strand of molecules. It's an encoding and decoding system. It's a storage system. It stores information like a hard drive and the data is formatted the same way as ethernet. Okay, so this is 
This diagram is decoding an Ethernet packet, okay? And this is DNA transcription and translation. It's the, mathematically, it's the same thing. It's ones and zeros. Only DNA has four letters and binary code has two. But basically, if you say, if, if you convert every base pair of DNA, ACGT, if you convert all of those into two bits, you have the same thing. The systems are isomorphic. It's digital communication. Well, guess what? They figured all this out in the 40s, 50s, 60s. They figured it all out. And in engineering, we have something called the OSA model. And the OSI model says that data is in layers. It's like Russian dolls, you know, where you have a doll inside a doll inside a doll? Okay, so if, if you get, if I send you an email, and it comes to you over your ethernet cable, then like you attach a Microsoft Word document and that's here, and then that's wrapped in something else and that's here, which is wrapped in something else and that's here, and th these are the ones and zeros that are actually on the ethernet cable, and this is the copper wire of the ethernet cable or the fiber or whatever it is, and so you have all these layers, and I realized genetic information is no different, it obeys the same rules. And this was like the biggest epiphany I just about ever had. Because I realized, hey, wait a minute, you know, I've been doing, see, in my career, I've built a gazillion speakers, like I designed the speakers in the Jeep Cherokee and the Ford Probe in the, um, the Honda Civic. Okay, so I know about signals and noise, and I've recorded albums for bands. I wrote an ethernet book. All that stuff, it applies to genetics. It's signals, and it's noise, and it's like keeping the signal clean in the presence of noise. And that means random mutations are the same as noise, which means that can't be where evolution comes from. Okay, and all the stuff started making perfect sense. And no, I want you to notice what I'm doing here is I'm drawing extensive deep parallels between two fields that normally don't talk to each other. So this is an interdisciplinary effort. So when a strand of DNA is read, what it does is it unwinds and the two sides of, of the helix are separated temporarily and messenger RNA copies from the DNA, and a ribosome turns uh, the letters into amino acids. So, this is encoding, this is a message, and this is decoding, just like any engineering communication system. Okay? I got it, I get this. I've hit the bottom of the swamp, right? It's just like F equals MA in that acoustics paper. Okay, I can start working from there. So now I can figure this out. So here's, here's what happened. So I have this definition of information. Information is a message sent between an encoder and a decoder according to the rules of a digital code. And when you have those four things, you have a communication system. And DNA trans, uh, translation and transcription is a communication system. And Claude Shannon is the main guy that figured all this stuff out. He wrote a landmark paper in 1948 called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. It's one of the most beautiful papers ever published in the history of science. Uh, Scientific American called it the Magna Carta of the Information Age. Basically, he figured out how much information can you actually get on a CD or on a USB stick or on a fiber optic cable, right? And this question is crucial to every high-tech company, you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, any of those guys. So he made all this possible. Encoding, I press A on a keyboard and a 10001 um, goes onto a wire, and then 1001 comes on a wire, and your screen shows a letter A. Encoding, decoding. 
So, all right, that makes sense. I get that. And I'll, I'll return to this in a second. But what about evolution? This doesn't answer whether evolution is possible or not. Here's what it does tell you. It tells you it's not accidental. And it's not random. There's no such thing as a communication system where you go, you know what, I'm not really happy with that Microsoft Word document, so I'm just gonna turn on an arc welder and make a bunch of static, and then, it, and then it's gonna occasionally make my Word document better, and then, and then that's gonna win instead of the other one. It doesn't work that way. It's much more orderly and structured than that. Now, most people, most people who are, come from a conservative Christian background and then ask these questions about engineering, most people in my situation would have just concluded that evolution wasn't true and they would become some flavor of like a, an old earth creationist. And I know a lot of people that have done that, but that's not the path I took. Because I was reading all these books and what I saw was, I see a lot, like a lot of anecdotal evidence that indicates that evolution is true and has happened, but the explanation they're giving me that is random copying errors can't possibly be right. I know that I know that I know that that explanation isn't right. I suspect that there's something else going on, I just don't know what it is. So this is where I was at, and I was there for two years. For two years, I just wasn't sure, and I suspended judgment, and sometimes you have to do that. Well, here's what I found out. I discovered a woman named Barbara McClintock. In the 1940s, she was using radiation to hack the DNA of corn plants. So she would dose moderate, measured doses of radiation, which would break the chromosomes. I think you all know, like, radiation is not good for you, right? She would do controlled doses. She would break chromosomes. And then she would watch the plants to see what would happen. And she had this idea what it would do. And the plant totally threw her curveball. So here's what happened. She breaks a chromosome of a plant. The plant wants to reproduce and it can't reproduce because of this chromosome is broken. The plant tried to repair the missing information. It tried to repair the data, but it couldn't do it because the information had been lost. So it went over to another chromosome and it got a piece of code from another chromosome and copied it over to this chromosome and modified the code so that it would work, it reprogrammed itself, and then it fixed the damage and went on to reproduce. Okay, so it would be like if one of your computer programs got corrupted and you went and found out some, some subroutine from some other program and you said, okay, this isn't the same, and it's not quite there, but if I jigger this and jigger this and rearrange these lines of code, I can make this work. And this is what the plant did. And she did this in 1944. And she was the first person to observe an evolutionary event and document genetically what had happened. And she figured it out. And I want to remind you that this is something like five years before Watson and Crick formally discovered DNA. So she's looking at chromosomes through a microscope, not knowing exactly what they're made of, but knowing at a higher level what's going on and watching all these pieces move around, and she figured it out, which was really remarkable, especially for the time. So she goes to a symposium at Cold Spring Harbor in New York, and she presents this. Well, what do you think happened? How did they receive this information? Does anybody want to guess? They jumped on it. <laughs> did, did they have a ticker tape parade and say, wow, Barbara, you figured out that plants can rearrange their own DNA? No, they were angry or outright making fun of her. 
And they did not accept her results, and they argued with her, and they thought she was crazy, and kind of laughed her out of the room. Barbara, everybody knows genes and chromosomes make plants. Plants don't re-engineer genes and chromosomes. Didn't anybody tell you? Okay, this is what happened. So she stopped publishing her work for 20 years, but she kept doing it. Okay, so when I found her work, and I'll return to her later, but when I found her work, that was like the missing piece. It was like I had a feeling I would find something like this. This was like an error correction system that could innovate and improvise, not just repair. Okay? I knew as soon as I realized that this is all digital code that cells had to have extensive error correction systems, and they do. In fact, the 2015 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was given to three scientists who figured out three critical layers of error detection correction and they applied it to cancer research. Very big deal, okay? There was no way life would still be here after three billion years if we didn't have an incredible error correction. But not only that, it can, it can innovate when it repairs. So I traded my creationism for natural genetic engineering. In other words, evolution is true, but it's not accidental, it's not random, it's purposeful, and it's actually engineered by the organism itself in response to the environment. So, Here's what I figured out. DNA is a code. All of the other codes that we know of are design. So like there's a million codes, 999,999 are designed by humans. And then we have this one code, we don't know where it's from, it's called DNA. It looks an awful lot like it must be designed, okay? I can't prove it, but it's a very strong inference. So, I had this friend named Andy. And Andy ran this program at the largest church in Chicago, a big med mega church called Willow Creek. And Andy knew about this, and he goes, Perry, you should come and give a talk about all this research you've been doing. So I went, this is 2005, I went, and I gave a talk called, If You Can Read This, I Can Prove God Exists. Sounds like something a marketer would, would say. Um, and when I said this, I didn't mean that I could actually prove that God exists. But what I did mean was that nobody has solved the design question in biology. How do you get a code without designing one? Where did the genetic code come from? Nobody knows. Now, one time, uh, about this same time period, I was listening to a radio program, and it was a Boston radio station. It was on NPR, or an NPR station anyway. And they had Richard Dawkins, the world's most famous atheist, on this radio show. And, um, and a, a caller called in and said, Mr. Dawkins, where did life come from? And without missing a beat, Richard Dawkins said, it was a happy chemical accident. And I listened to that, and I was like, did he just say that? you got to be kidding. Like, okay, this has error detection and error correction and, and redundancy, and it's like Ethernet packets, and, uh, and that isn't even the start of it. I mean, there's so much more. Happy chemical accident? This guy's from Oxford University, and he's actually saying this? You gotta be kidding, and it just, it just made me angry. Well, so I gave this talk, and it went viral. So I put it on my website, I had a recording, and so pretty soon, I got all these atheists coming, and man, they're, they're upset, they are not happy. And so I'm going back and forth to this guy, and I'm backing him into a corner, and he's not liking it. And uh, at one point, he sends me an email. He goes, Perry, I posted a link to your talk on infidels. You can talk to all the guys on infidels about this. So th this was the world's largest atheist website 
at the time, and it was the largest discussion board for atheists on the entire internet. And I'm like, oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Really appreciate that. So there's like one of me and 50 of them, and they are mad as hornets. And he said, hey, I've been going back and forth with this Perry Marshall guy. Be nice to him while you rip him to shreds. Great, here we are. So I have to defend myself. So here's what happens. This became, it's right here, this became the longest running, most viewed thread in the history of infidels. This screenshot was taken um, 2010. So that's five years after it began, because this started in 2005. This kept going for two more years, seven years. And at first it was like every day I would go in and post. Eventually it was like every week, and then it was like every three months. Nobody solved it. DNA is a code. They, they try to tell me a million reasons why it's not a code. No, it's a code. Look it up, okay? All the other codes are designed. No, snowflakes aren't designed, and sand, snowflakes and sand dunes are not codes. Rocks are not codes. HTML is a code. Barcodes are codes. Zip codes are codes. Chinese a code. Sand dunes are not a code, right? So we had that whole thing, you know. So went round and round in circles, and they, they couldn't punch a hold in. And if you thought they were mad at the beginning of this, you should have seen them by now. Man, they were really angry. But they couldn't, they couldn't solve it. Well, there was only one problem, and the problem was is the argument would go around in circles because people wouldn't accept the definitions. And one day, I got this idea. Perry, you need to tell them how to prove you wrong. Oh, so I wrote a specification, and I stole it. I stole it right out of an engineering textbook. And I put up a spec. Perry, write a spec and offer the guy $10,000 if he can solve it. And I didn't know what would happen, but I went and I wrote the spec and I put it on. I said, listen, if you can show me a code that's not designed, then here's how you do it, and here's how you know you got a code at the end of your experiment, if you can get a code without designing one, I will write you a check for $10,000. And you know what happened? He disappeared. Like, it was over. It was just over. No more going around in circles, no more name calling, just stopped. All right, so this is Brian. This, he's the guy that started all this. So he's watching all this. He thinks it's rather interesting. Brian says, Perry, that's really nice. You're bonking atheists on the head. You're backing them into a corner. Good for you. He goes, but seriously, like what? What do you think a scientist is supposed to do? You think a scientist is supposed to say, God did it. That settles it. Let's go out to lunch. Like, can Dr. Niryanan say, God did it. That settles it. Let's go out to lunch in his next scientific paper? No. Like, you have to get to the bottom of this. You can't just abdicate. And little by little, I started to realize that if you picked one side or the other and just planted your stake in the ground, you weren't helping science or discovery happen. You're just doing dogma. So Richard Dawkins saying, oh, it's a happy chemical accident, he's not helping. Okay? And the conservative religious people going, well, God did it. I still believe in God, okay, and up to a point, that's fine, but it's, it's, it's not in any sense an immediate answer to the question, and it doesn't help you peel the onion. And what I realize is we need to peel the onion. Is there a way that you can get from chemicals to code without a designer? Maybe there is. Maybe we haven't discovered it. So what I did was I traded my God of the gaps argument, which is what you call this, when somebody says, well, we haven't figured out, therefore God did it, that's a God of the gaps argument. And those have a long history of not ending up well. Somebody figures something out, and then, oh, well, where did God go? And then you're always chasing God through all these gaps, okay? And I traded it for a decision to never sweep vital questions under the rug. And so what I did, I 
I took a specification out of this book, like this is a standard digital engineering communication textbook, and I wrote this a specification, and when my book, Evolution 2.0, came out, right here, I raised the prize amount. And now, instead of being a $10,000 prize, it's a $5 million prize, and it's a search for a patent. So, here, watch this. How are your own thoughts different from a Google search? Google matches patterns, but it's unaware of you or itself. Our brains also match patterns, but our minds are aware of both ourselves and others. This awareness empowers us to make choices. Computers don't choose. They obey pre-made rules. Minds make and break the rules. Somehow, our minds bridge the gap between passive chemicals and creative code. If the origin of life on Earth is a valid science, then this must be possible. Earth somehow made the jump from chemicals to code. But how? Where did the first cell get its plan? And how do you get a code without designing one? It's time to find out. A private equity investment group known as Natural Code LLC has funded a technology prize to reward the first person who can solve origin of information. There is no industry that won't be impacted by this. There is no human being who won't enjoy its benefits. But it must be a real experiment, and it must produce a code with nobody having to design one. If you discover it and we can together patent it, you will receive a multi-million dollar financial reward. Your name will go down in history for having discovered a landmark of 21st century science and one of the most pivotal new technologies of our age. Apply your ingenuity and let's solve this. Together, we'll develop it to its full potential and license it to the world. Follow this challenge and you'll get regular updates on our progress. So, if you can produce a self-organizing digital communication system, we'll write you a check for $100,000. And if your process is patentable, we'll pay, you for the pa we'll pay for the patent. Like, we'll hire the lawyers and do all that. I've got a group of entrepreneurs and investors who are very business savvy um, and will cover the patent cost and when the patent is granted, we'll write you a check for $5 million. And we'll partner you into the company as well. Now, if you come up with this, you can certainly try to go talk to Microsoft on your own because I think they would buy this in a hot second if it was discovered, but you have to remember that you're negotiating with a very savvy, lean, mean, cunning machine, okay? And they need to know that people that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars can sue them if they take this. And I have people on my investment panel that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and so uh, they're probably not gonna try to pull something like this if we discover it. Uh, now, why a prize? Um, well, prizes are really good for questions that traditional scientific research has not been able to make much progress on. So in the 1990s, a guy named Peter Diamandis put together a $10 million prize called the X Prize for Space Flight. And he believed that we didn't need big governments to make space programs. He believed that private entities could do a better job and do it for less money. And so he put up a $10 million prize. He said if a private company can get a spacecraft to fly twice in two weeks, reusable spacecraft, um, then we'll write you a check for $10 million. And 10 years later, a team uh, headed up by Paul Allen, who was from Microsoft, got the $10 million. And they spent $25 million to get the 10, okay? But they proved that you could make a spaceship for $25 million which is a order of magnitude better than what governments could do, okay? Well, origin of life is one of the most unsuccessful endeavors in biology. You know, compared to all the other fields, it has gotten not very far um, in the last hundred years. 
And I think a good way to solve this is to put up money for somebody to take a completely different approach. This is the central question in biology. Nobody has solved the design question in biology until they have solved the question of where does code come from, okay? Number two is cells do something that computer programs don't do, which is rewrite their own code. So let me ask you a question. So how many of you ever used DOS? Okay, so if DOS, imagine that Bill Gates put DOS out into the world in 1982 or whatever that was, and let's say that no human touched DOS since, and let's say that DOS sensed that there was an internet connection and wrote internet drivers, and let's say it sensed that there was a mouse and it developed a connection to a mouse and it developed a Windows desktop, and it developed Microsoft Word, it developed Excel, and it developed antivirus, and it updated, it updated virus definitions automatically. If, if DOS did that, would you be impressed? Okay, that's how everybody should feel about evolution. You sure wouldn't think it happened by accident, okay? The cells do this in real time. Your immune system does this in real time, okay? So evolution is the most remarkable thing, and nobody really understands how it works, because if they did, we, our software would evolve the way cells do, and it doesn't. So don't you think we should figure this out? Okay, here's another reason for prize. Okay, so you throw a steak on your kitchen table, and you look at your dog and you go, don't eat that steak, and then you leave the room. <laughs> and then the dog decides if he's gonna eat your steak. Right? And we all, we all know the guilty dog that ate the steak, we've all seen that, right? And we have all know the submissive dog that didn't eat the steak, oh, I, I obeyed you, right? Like, just before I came on this trip, my dog peed in my library. And then I went downstairs and the dog was cowering under the table because she knew she wasn't supposed to do that and she did it. So, you know, dogs have shame. So, living things have the ability to decide whether or not to eat the steak. And computers don't. Living things do something that computers don't. And it's an information thing. Okay, it's a one or a zero. One, eat the steak. Zero, do not eat the steak. But it's a free choice. Computers don't have that. So there's something going on here that we don't understand. Number four, if we solve this, okay, if we figure out how cells self-evolve and we have similar technology, do you think Apple would want to buy it? Or Microsoft, or Google, or Facebook, or Amazon? Absolutely they would. Google is buying up AI companies left and right. They paid a billion dollars for DeepMind, which is this little tiny company with like 10 engineers, okay? You bet they would. Here's another reason why we need a prize. So, I don't know if you guys realize this, but it is now possible to edit genes as easily as Microsoft Word. It's called CRISPR. CRISPR is a gene editing technology that was borrowed from bacteria. It's a way that bacteria fight viruses, okay? And they hacked it and they co-opted it so that they could do find and replace just like with Microsoft Word, essentially. You can buy a $169 gene editing kit on Amazon and edit genes in your lab, like tomorrow. Yeah. Now, do you think that could be scary? I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, it is terrifying. Okay. So, as long as everybody thinks that the hand at the end of my arm evolved by accident, people are going to not have very much respect for the systematic process that cells use to make these evolutionary changes. Like, now is the time for us to understand what's really going on inside those cells 
And now is the time for us to decide we're not smarter than the cells are. A bacterium can do more engineering in 12 minutes than a team of Google engineers can do in 12 weeks. If Microsoft knew what bacteria know, their stock price would go up 100x. So let's be really careful about like editing the whole human race or whatever, and let's not rush in where angels fear to tread. Now, this is Mr. G on the right, that's my mom and dad on the left. So my dad gets himself reinstated, he vindicates himself, he gets his old job back, he gets his honor back, and a month later he has cancer. Well, okay, so our relatives were telling us, get the hell out of Dodge, okay? It was like, don't put up with this. Go somewhere where people have some respect for you. You've been done a huge injustice. And he said, I'm gonna stick it out, I'm gonna stay right here, I'm gonna vindicate myself, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna maintain my position. And that's what he did, and it worked. Well, I'm glad he did, because then all of a sudden we got all these church people around us and dad had these cancer treatments and somebody wrote checks to cover all his plane tickets because he couldn't afford the plane tickets. And people were bringing casseroles and people are shoveling our snow and they're helping us with all these things while you know dad's in the hospital. Well, dad got better, then the cancer came back, then he had all these treatments again and he's going downhill and it's starting to become obvious that he's not gonna make it and um, so one day at church, uh, Mr. G on the right, he gets done early and he says, Bob and Betty, come to the front, please. And they have no idea what's going on, no idea whatsoever. And he goes, well, you know, you've been going through a hard time. And um, so what we did was we, we sent out a letter to everybody and we said, Bob would really like to go on a vacation to California. Bob's never gone to California before and people sent in some money, and guess what? We raised $10,000, and you guys can go on a vacation, and we want to do that for you. Wow, and we did. Um, it was five weeks, and uh, this is 1986, by the way, and uh, my brother and I and my mom and dad, we went to the West Coast, and we also made it to Alaska, we also made it to Hawaii, and um, you know, it's like, our last trip with dad. And my dad died three months later. And you know all those 2,000 people that were sitting in the church listening to Bob has decided to step down from his position because of problems with Betty and the family? Well, those same people, they were all at his funeral. He had 2,000 people at his funeral. It was pretty impressive. Barbara McClintock won the Nobel Prize in 1983 she discovered something called transposition, which is now universally known to any competent biologist as a way that cells restructure their genomes when things around them are changing. It's sort of like if you move adverbs and adjectives around in a sentence, you can make it say different things. That's basically what transposons do. And they're absolutely key to the process of evolution because cells are smart and they reprogram themselves. And so, seeing that, so you have to understand, you have to understand something. Why did they reject her notion that corn plants could edit their own DNA? Well, when you get right down to it, it was because of a materialistic, anti-religious bias that said everything is just laws of physics, everything is just reductionism, they, they didn't have any room in their imagination for the notion that a cell would do anything like that. It wasn't even in their imagination. But she was an empiricist. She said, if I see it happens, it's real. And it's real whether I have a theory for how it happened or not. And she had a much more mystical view of biology than her colleagues, which enabled her to recognize things, but then she brought the rigor of science to her observation and she figured out what had happened. Okay, so, 
you know, where I grew up, it was the religious people having a war against science. And where she was working, it was the science people having a war against religion. And that's really why they wouldn't accept what she was talking about. It's not that transposons are religious, but the notion that nature is more than the sum of its parts is a holistic way of looking at nature. So with what I'm doing, this project used to be about, you know, bonking atheists on the head and like, well, I scored one on you. But I kind of outgrew that. And what I found was if I tried to force the God conclusion onto people, if they didn't want to go there, it was like waterboarding them or something, you know. They don't want to go there. They're not going to go there. I found that it would just shut down the conversation. What I found was that if I hold it as an open question, if I say nobody's solved the design problem in biology, but look at what these cells do, and look at what nature does, and look at how much we don't understand, and here, here's a big pile of money for people that could figure out this particular problem. It opens up conversation, and it becomes a demilitarized zone. Kind of like the strip of land between North and South Korea. Nobody gets to shoot if you're in that band. Nobody gets to shoot. I have found that there's all these factions. There's the young earth creationists, there's the hardcore atheists, and there's all these shades in between, and there's all these different scientific models. I have not found any group in this conversation that doesn't have something valuable to say. I've learned very valuable things from hardcore right-wing young earth creationists. I've learned very valuable things from hardcore left-wing virulent atheists. And I've learned a lot more than I learned from either one of them, <laughs> from people in the middle. Every corner, creationists, atheists, design theorists, physicists, biologists, doctors, engineers, philosophers, I find that for the most part, these different camps don't want to talk to each other, but they have to. You know, if we're going to start editing genes with $169 kits from Amazon, like, we better, we better figure this out. Now, if it makes you feel any better, you have to show that you're a lab, and then Amazon will send you the kit. My, my kids tried to buy me one for my birthday, and Amazon wouldn't ship it. It's like, well, what lab is Mr. Marshall from? So anyway, if it makes you feel a little bit better, but... It doesn't mean that the person doing the experiment has any respect for the real true mystery of the evolutionary process. They, they probably just think it happened by accident. A lot of people say that. So Evolution 2.0 is a book, like you see here. It's also a prize, and it's also a demilitarized zone. So step one, meet the spec, you get 100 grand, regardless of anything. Number two, we're going to try to patent the process. If a patent is granted, step three, $5 million. There's a site called HeroX.com, which Peter Diamandis put together. Basically, it's X prize for anybody. We're the largest prize on HeroX. There's other prizes from NASA, Coca-Cola, IBM, other companies. Somebody pointed out to me when I got into this process, Perry, you need some judges. I go, why do I need judges? Like, I'll know whether somebody won this thing or not. And they go, well, number one, there could be a dispute, and you need people to mediate the dispute. Number two, you need credible academic people that can lend some credence to what you're doing. So, George Church. He's the leading geneticist at Harvard Medical School. He helped me write the specification that's now on the site. Uh, I met with him last summer. We spent an hour talking about what could go wrong with gene editing. That was kind of fun. Um, but very famous geneticist. Everybody in genetics knows who this guy is. He's a rock star. Dennis Noble of Oxford. Dennis is the guy who figured out the cardiac rhythm which made pacemakers possible. He was the first person to model a human organ on a computer, which he did in 1960. Um, at City College London on a mainframe. He like begged, borrowed, and stole computer time from the computer guys when he was in school and he figured, he, he modeled the heart. And he got a Commander of the British Empire medal from Queen Elizabeth 
for doing that. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. He organized a major evolution conference at the Royal Society two years ago. And I met him there and I asked him to be on my judging panel. Uh, he's a wonderful guy, he's 82 years old. Michael Ruse, Florida State University. The president of Hero X said, Perry, you need an atheist on your team. So I got one. It's this guy. Uh, he's a delightful guy. He's a professor at Florida State University. He's a professor of the philosophy of science and the philosophy of, and history of biology. He's written a whole bunch of books about evolution. He's been a expert witness at creationist trials in the 1980s. Uh, really friendly guy. I've got George, I've got uh, Dennis, and, and I got Michael on my judging panel. Wonderful guys. And if there's a dispute, these guys will help me mediate the dispute. Here are the rules of the demilitarized zone. Number one, put down your weapons. Most people, this, this conversation makes people nervous. It brings up the worst in people. Like, we could be talking about evolution, abortion, gay rights, gun control, immigration, like take your pick. Really, you know, jangle nerves kind of topics, okay? Put down your weapons, okay? You can't come in here and shoot people. Number two, no hiding behind screen names. I find anonymity brings out the worst in people. You use your real name. I don't let people post blog comments unless they use their real name. You will use your real name and you will use your manners. And you will talk to other people like they're real human beings. You assume positive intention. This is really valuable. Even the person absolutely hacks you off and makes you angry, you should operate under the assumption that there's a good motive behind what they believe, even if you think it's ridiculous. Like people, people want to do the best they can even if you completely disagree with it. That's a really good stance to take. And get to the truth, not the sale. That's a phrase from my friend Ari Galper. And that means if you're a car salesman and somebody comes looking for a car, you don't just ram the next car down their throat that you want them to buy. You figure out the car that they need to drive. When you talk to any kind of a salesperson or you're in any kind of a transaction and you can tell that they're really trying to get to the truth of whether this is gonna help you rather than just ramming something down your throat. Well, same with this. Like, we don't get to assume, we don't get to pretend that any fact is not a fact. If we can verify that it's a fact, then, then we accept it. So, your will to discover the truth must be greater than your fear. When I went down this rabbit hole, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I thought it might make me an atheist, Maybe Brian and I are gonna to go to Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's gonna to pray to their invisible sky daddy and we're just gonna sit there and scowl at them. I mean, I don't know, okay? But I had to be willing to follow the truth wherever it led me. And if I hadn't been willing to do that, I would have never discovered all this stuff. This became the most fascinating thing I've ever looked into. It's like, wow, this is like a rabbit hole. It just goes deeper, 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 deeper. But you can't discover new things unless you're willing to let go of the old. So, um, I think if we can solve this problem, we'll have strong artificial intelligence. You realize that AI doesn't exist. You know, everybody talks about AI. You know Siri is as dumb as a box of rocks, right? Like Siri is not even as smart as your goldfish. There's this thing called a Turing test. And the Turing test is, how long can I talk to a computer before I figure out it's a computer? How long can a computer fool me into thinking it's a human? Well, I don't know, 30 seconds? 45? Maybe a minute? Nobody's gotten very far in the Turing test. And you know what? They won't until they solve this prize. Because whatever it is that cells do, it's top down. And everything computers do is, is bottom up. Right. It's a completely different thing, totally different. If, if somebody solves this, it's one of the top 10 basic science discoveries of the 21st century. It's as valuable as the transistor. Like, how valuable was the transistor? How much was it worth to humanity to invent the transistor? Incalculable. If Microsoft knew what one bacterium knows, their stock price would spike 10x, maybe 100. What if we ended the war between science and religion? 
right? I've had enough of that war. Science asks how questions. Religion asks why questions. They operate on intersecting but different planes of reality. And we desperately need insights for genetic engineering. If we're going to be manipulating genes and doing all this, kind of, I mean, the toothpaste is out of the tube. Nobody's putting it back. We are going to be editing genes whether you like it or not. The only question is how much reverence are we going to have for what we're messing with? So uh, my book, Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design, if you thought that this was fascinating so far, I think you'll enjoy the book. It's on Amazon. It's in some of the bookstores. So thank you, and I hope you guys will have some questions and discussion. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate uh, Perry for uh, taking the time off his busy schedule to come to Penn State and make this presentation. Thank you all for your uh, attendance. And please uh, feel free to ask him any questions. You uh, mentioned something about our former department head you're going to talk. Is that something, is the right forum for that? Sukup? Oh, yeah, I got to tell you that story. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> OK, so yeah, thanks for reminding me. So we had this guy named Dr. Sukup in the electrical engineering department. And I took his signal analysis class. And, and one day, he gave us this problem. He said, OK, solve this equation. And everybody takes it home, and they start working at it. And after a while, I was like, I can't figure out how to solve this. And pretty soon, every, everybody's meeting up in the engineering library, like, do you know how to solve this? No, I don't know how to solve this. I look at all these books and stuff. I don't know how to solve this. So then they're, then they're, they're talking to professors, and they're asking other professors. And you know, finally, one of the professors is like, oh, well, you have to use numerical methods to solve this kind of a problem. And then you have to plug it into a computer. And by the way, at that point in time, it wasn't real common to be given a problem that could only be solved by a computer. I mean, I've got apps on my phone that would solve that equation in like two milliseconds. But you know, I didn't have that then. And so, so we finally, we, we kind of higgity-piggity kind of figured this thing out. And then we come to class. And I, I was really mad by the time I got to class. Like, he didn't tell us. So I raised my hand. I'm kind of like my dad. I was like not afraid of the guy, even though Dr. Sukup was kind of like this military, stern kind of guy, you know, like really serious. He never smiled in his life. He, no, he never, he never, <laughs> this guy never smiled. And I go, I go, you didn't tell us anything. We're, we're sitting here. We're whistling Dixie in the dark. We're looking in all these books. We're bugging other professors. We're taking the time from the other members of your department. You didn't like help us at all. He just stared at me. So, it's like I wanted to give you a problem that was hard. Like, what's the problem here? You know? And so in, in the moment, I was kind of upset. After I had some time to think about it, it was like, well, you know. What I was used to in school was every question you're given, somebody knows the answer. And it's just about finding the right answer, the right answer, the right answer, right? And you just, you just do this over and over and over and over and over and over again in school. And what I realized was that problem was actually like the problems I have in real life. <laughs> OK? Like most problems I have in real life, most problems I have in business, most problems that re require a technological breakthrough either, yes, there is an answer, but nobody really exactly knows who knows it. You're just going to have to go out and find them. Or nobody's ever solved this problem, and you're going to have to figure it out. And there is no answer that's going to pop out like a jack-in-the-box. In retrospect, Dr. Sokup's little problem was a very instructive thing. He, he should have given us more. Now, if I were him, I might have said, hey, you know, you guys are going to find that this problem is harder than it looks. And you're going to have to look in some unusual places. But, you know, he didn't have to say that, nor should he have to say that. Most of the hard problems in life are like that. And you'll find there's a lot of things that nobody has the answer. And if you can enjoy the process of discovering these things, then problem solving could be a lot of fun. So.
Yes, thank you for reminding me to tell, tell that story. So, you have a lot of breakthrough. yeah, well. yeah, so, yeah. You talked about optimization, but now we have genetic algorithms. What is your thinking on that? Okay, so genetic algorithms are one of many, many tools that are available, and they're by no means necessarily the best tools to use. It's like a genetic algorithm is a good tool when you have a very finite solution space and you just need to explore all the possible solutions. There are experiments where they experiment with RNA and ribozymes, which are, so they're little, little short strands of RNA that can be, that can turn into enzymes and enzymes are, enzymes are machines. Enzymes are nanomachines is what they are, okay? So you hear this word enzymes, it's a nanomachine that speeds a chemical reaction like times a thousand or times a million. And so when medical companies are trying to come up with a new ribozyme, they'll do experiments where they take little short strands of RNA, maybe 25 base, base pairs long, and they'll generate 10 to the 15 of these things in a solution and they'll just keep running them and running them by brute force until they find one that works and then they'll turn it into a medicine. And that is classic Darwinian evolution literally by accident. Well, if you have more than 50 base pairs, which isn't a lot, it won't work anymore. Okay, so in other words, Darwinian evolution will only actually work, like the, the kind you all hear about in school, it will only work on things that are one one thousandth as complex as a cell. But they won't work on things as complex as a cell. Cells have a whole other set of tools for what they actually do, okay? And they're called transposition in horizontal gene transfer and hybridization and symbiogenesis and epigenetics, for example. In Evolution 2.0, I call them the Swiss Army Knife, okay? So evolution in real cells happens much, much differently than what everybody hears in the pop culture and reads about in the freshman biology books. It's almost like most people don't notice the contradiction, but the evolution of a senior biology book and the evolution in a freshman biology book are almost incompatible. And nobody really notices, but it's true. Uh, and, and so genetic algorithms have a certain amount of utility, but at some point you need a whole nother set of tools. I find it fascinating you have an atheist on the panel. That complex question in your mind. So you're going to find that their conclusion could be that okay, there's this design thing going on with the cells, but are they taking the position that this is a random thing that they're not going to accept there's a higher power somehow that's behind that, or is this like a random thing that somehow just? So I'm just curious what their take is on that. Well, so you have all kinds of views on the origin of life. Okay, there's. You know, God literally created the first cell. There's, well, God made a universe that's so fine-tuned that it would produce a cell. There's the RNA hypothesis, which is basically that, you know, these processes I described that they use to make drugs with ribozymes, that those eventually got bigger and bigger and turned into the first cell. Um, there's all kinds of other theories. Here's kind of how I conceptualize it. I think that, in my personal opinion, it is abundantly obvious that we live in a divinely ordered universe, like the fine-tuning of the Big Bang and the fine-tuning of the physical constants and all these things that pure chance does not adequately explain. And nobody who tells you that pure chance explains it is being honest with the statistics. Okay, but at the same time, you have to be very careful because if you say, okay, well, God did it. Well, how many layers of the wonders of nature are you skipping when you jump all the way to that end point? What if there's, for all practical purposes, an infinite number of layers? 
what, what if it's turtles all the way down? What if there's another mystery and another mystery and another mystery? So like, for example, we can all agree that there's this thing called gravity. Does anybody really understand it? As far as I know, they don't. It's like, well, there's gravity. Okay, we have a name for it. I have this attraction, and it follows this law-like behavior. Do I actually know what it is that is pushing me down? I don't think so, right? Well, I bet there's more and more and more explanations. And as far as I can tell, science just is bottomless. I don't think you ever run out. And so there's kind of a yin and a yang. It's like nature may be infinitely deep, and it had to come from somewhere. So can you hold those two things in tension and not turn it into a war? It's like maybe we don't have to have a war between two paradoxical things, right? Now, if people, if people take a big magic marker and they X out God, what they usually end up doing is dumbing down science to fit it. So like, for example, the junk DNA hypothesis. For decades, people said 97% of your DNA is junk. Look, that proves evolution, and it proves there's no God, and it proves there's no design. Well, it turns out that was a horrible mistake. Terribly irresponsible. No, 95% of your DNA is not junk. Trust me, okay? And in fact, Whenever you find something in your DNA and you say, I don't know what this is for, get busy because it has some kind of a function. Maybe Mother Nature is saving it for a rainy day. Right. Yep. Seriously, I'm yeah. completely serious, okay? So like, for example, CRISPR, the gene editing technology, the, the, seg, the, the code for the CRISPR program in bacterial DNA was believed to be junk DNA until recently. And it turns out, oh, that's where they store all the information about all the different kinds of viruses they've encountered so that they can recognize them when they come back again. And you know, there were snooty scientists that said, oh, there's just all these repetitive sequences and all this genetic garbage in there, it doesn't do anything, and it just proves that evolution is very inefficient. Wrong totally wrong. We can't, we can't be making mistakes like this. Mm -hmm. And the junk DNA argument was almost always pushed by an atheist point of view. Like, like the Venn diagram between atheists and junk DNA was always like <laughs> 75%, okay? Because it was like a script. It was like, no, life is meaningless, life is purposeless, life is full of garbage. It's like a narrative. Well, I don't live in that narrative. Life is purposeful, life is efficient, life is adaptive, life is proactive, you have choices, okay? That's an empowering view of the world. 